This is the video based on the second chapter of Towards a New Socialism, where we present our ideas for how Marxist economics can be used to reduce or eliminate inequalities that exist under capitalism. Basically, we're saying that the inequalities caused by capitalist exploitation and unemployment can be effectively eliminated. And in doing this, we, we're relying on very old socialist principles, ideas which were around in the 19th century. And in a sense, you can say they date back even further to the classical economists like Adam Smith and David Ricardo. The basic idea is that in a just society, the principle has to operate that only those who work so, sorry, the principle has to operate that those who work are entitled to the full proceeds of their labour. And along with this comes a second principle, that only work is a legitimate source of income. Now, it obviously follows that if you say work has to be the source of income, property incomes get eliminated. So, income from rent, dividend or interest Anything which derives from the ownership of property rather than personal effort gets eliminated. And it's obviously a necessary consequence of the first principle, since in a society where producers are entitled to the full proceeds of their labour, there isn't anything left over to supply unearned income. Now, probably the first person to put this forward was Mr. Bray. Marx says, we'll content ourselves with listening to an English communist, Mr. Bray. We shall give the decisive passages in his remarkable work, Labour's Wrongs and Labour's Remedy. This is what Bray says. It's labour alone which bestows value. Every man has an undoubted right to all that his honest labour can procure him. When he thus appropriates the fruits of his labour, he commits no injustice on any other human being, for he interferes with no other man's right of doing the same with the produce of his labour. All these ideas of superior and inferior, of master and man, may be traced back to the neglect of first principles and to the consequent rise of inequality of possessions, and such ideas will never be subverted as so long as this inequality is maintained. So that's from 1839. And fast forward to 1919 and you get the Labour Party adopting very similar principles in its constitution uh, where it says it'll secure for the workers by hand or by brain the full fruits of their industry and the most equitable distribution thereof that may be possible upon the basis of the common ownership of the means of production, distribution and exchange and the best obtainable system of popular administration and control of each industry or service. This was the Labour Party constitution which was jettisoned by Blair when he um, shifted Labour to become the Red Tories. And we find a similar though more precise formulation of it by Marx where he says when he's talking about the Gotha programme of the German Socialist Party he says, accordingly, the individual producer gets back from society after deductions exactly what he has given it. What he has given it is his individual quantum of labour. For instance, the working day consists of the sum of the individual hours of work. The individual the labour time of the individual producer constitutes his contribution to the social working day, his share of it. Society gives him a certificate stating that he's done such and such an amount of work after the labour done for the communal fund has been deducted, and with this certificate he can withdraw from the social supply of means of consumption as much as costs the equivalent amount of labour. The same amount of labour is given to society in one form, he receives back in another. The great merit of these old principles is they provide a coherent foundation for an entire system, not just of economic organisation, but also a whole legal, moral and social order. People would be credited with hours worked 
run money at the end of the week. And payment for goods and services would be in terms of time. If you had a shirt that took two hours to produce, you would pay for it with two hours of your own time. And an economy based on time has built into it the democratic presumption of human equality. And it's important to realise that this isn't actually money. You get some um, modern leftists who call themselves value form theories who reject this because they say this is too like money. But Marx says that they're not money. They can only be obtained by labour and can only be exchanged against consumer goods. Talking about another of the Ricardian socialists, Robert Owen, Marx says that his so-called labour money was not money at all because, on this point, I'll only say that Owen's labour money, for example, is no more money than a theatre ticket is. Owen presupposes directly socialised labour, a form of production diametrically opposed to the production of commodities. The certificate of labour is merely evidence of the part taken by the individual in the common labour, and his claim to a certain portion of the common product, which has been set aside for consumption. So he's comparing them to theatre tickets. And when he compares them to theatre tickets, we can draw certain assumptions. Firstly, the certificates don't circulate. They can only be directly exchanged against consumer goods. And like tickets, they're non-transferable. Only the person who has performed the labour could use them, and they'll be cancelled as soon as they are handed in. They're not you. When you go into a theatre, you hand in your ticket, and they either tear it in half, or if they take it, they certainly don't issue it to anyone else afterwards. So they're cancelled after a single use. When individuals withdraw goods from a communal shop, their vouchers would be cancelled. And since the shop is a communal organisation, not a business, it doesn't have to buy in goods. It just is allocated them. So its only interest in the labour vouchers is for record keeping purposes and to make sure that people are not filching things. And beyond that, they wouldn't serve as a store of value. It'd be perfectly feasible to put a use by date on them. And unless people use their share of this year's output, it would be no use. It'd be assumed they don't want it. If the labour tokens are not spent, then the goods embodied with the labour would not be used. And many goods are perishable, so they would have to be disposed somehow. So there's no point allowing the tickets to persist. Nowadays, you, you can envisage a system in which you're not actually using paper certificates. You'd almost certainly have some kind of electronic card uh, based on the technologies that have already been developed, uh, allowing you to withdraw a certain amount of labour. So this forms a model of socialism. Marx gives a, a model, a skeletal one, of a socialist society in which there are no commodities. That is to say, goods produced specifically for exchange on the market. People are paid by labour credits. Deductions are made for communal needs. And goods are distributed on the basis of the labour content, with corresponding deductions from people's credit accounts. And production is organised on a directly social basis with intermediate products, that is to say, means of production, never assuming the form of commodities. Now, the right of the socialist movement is very dubious about this. They question whether anyone would really be better off. They say it would be unfair to allocate everyone the same amount of time credits for one hour's work because human beings, they say, are unequal. And they say an economy is far too complex to work according to labour time calculations. Now, later chapters in our book answer these objections and I'll be summarising them 
later in further videos.